Hello and welcome to another episode of me painting again. Oh yeah, we're painting again and uh, this time we have the wooden palette out. Actually, I'm using this all the time now because uh, it's a perfect size to put in my fridge. Yep, that's right. That's the reason. So on the palette, here we have a few colours that you can see. Um, I tend to have my lights one end of the palette and then work round to my darks. It seems to work quite well. The uh, so there's out of shot. There's uh, cad yellow, um, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and then uh, along the top is a green. You could use sap green, but I'm using chromium oxide green. Uh, some burnt sienna, permanent alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, burnt umber, and ivory black. So they're the colours on the palette, I can choose whether to use them or not, so <laughs> I sometimes I put a colour on and I never use it throughout the whole painting, but it's there uh, available for me. And uh, so let's uh, see what I get up to on this painting. Just loading my brush, loading my brush. Move my mouse. Loading the brush with a little bit of ultramarine blue and white. And now uh, we're going to create our background. I just dipped into some more white there using the one inch brush. The canvas is dry, um, it's been double primed with uh, gesso and uh, <laughs> the canvas has actually been stretched and stapled on by my very own hands. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm becoming more practical with my uh, painting and learning the techniques of creating your own canvases and making your own paints. There will be a video soon on uh, making your own paints if you're interested and uh, a little bit of the information that you might find interesting. I'll just throw it out there. <laughs> so I'm scrubbing this paint on. I don't want too much on there. I just want it to kind of stain the canvas really. So this method <laughs> that I'm using at the moment you could do this with liquid white on the canvas if you wanted or you could do it with liquid clear on the canvas or you could do it with nothing on the canvas like I'm doing you see with this uh, what I'm doing is I'm mixing white in with my blue so I'm making myself a, uh, a nice light blue mixture and throwing that on for the background because uh, this is based on an area that I walk when uh, I want to catch some oxygen <laughs> when I don't want to be cooped up inside I go for a walk in the woods and then uh, I can have a look around at the lighting situations and the, uh, the wildlife and the horses and people riding by on their horse looking at me wondering why I'm stood there with a sketchbook and a pencil <laughs> in fact when I was uh, out painting and it was freezing I mean it was really cold but you know I was painting and it didn't bother me you kind of forget about your, cold, your hands being almost frozen to your brush when you're painting <laughs> so I'm just getting some uh, green Mixing it with a white there. Bit of burnt sienna. I just mix in with a knife. Pick it up, turn it over, flatten it out. A little bit of burnt umber in there. So what I'm making is a colour for the background for the trees that you can see. It was a little bit misty this day um, and uh, 
just going to try and match that with my colour. So yeah, I was out painting, painting away. I was painting this uh, old um, stables, and uh, it's quite a good one actually. It's got like a uh, clock tower where you can see there would be a bell in it and stuff, and uh, it was part of an old manor house. But the manor house is gone, and the uh, all that remains is an old stables. <laughs> There's a few uh, random things dotted around that I've found as well. Quite interesting. But anyway, I was painting away there, and this guy on the horse, he uh, <laughs> he felt the need to uh, show himself with his phone, like looking at me while he was in the abandoned stables. Maybe he owns it or something. I thought it was a bit weird. I just carried on. I wasn't doing any harm. I was just painting. <laughs> and then I saw him again after I'd left and I was walking. And uh, he was on his horse. And he just rode uh, next to me and he went, Hello. <laughs> and I went, Oh, hi. <laughs> I carried on walking. That was strange. So, yeah, there's my mixture. It's just a, a light browny, <laughs> greeny colour. So colour mixing is something uh, that you just get used to by doing. Uh, some people would suggest that you mix colours and make squares, but I personally think that's a waste of time. <laughs> And uh, I'll tell you why. I know um, I, I don't want to upset anyone, but the reason why I think that's a waste of time is you could be using that time mixing colours and painting something instead of mixing colours to create squares. I mean, you're going to uh, learn a lot faster by painting something and mixing the colours you see rather than mixing squares and just l putting a bit more white in and a bit more white in and oh great yeah that's lighter <laughs> or um <laughs> it's just a personal thing um i don't want it to st you to not do it um because it might help you and i don't want to say things won't help you i just feel that your time would be better spent if you're wondering if it's worth mixing squares um, I would say m just mix colours for things and you'll progress a lot quicker my personal opinion it's worked better for me um, have I done the square mixing thing I did once when I was trying to work out portraits and uh, <laughs> I uh, did all these mixes with different colours for uh, portraits I followed this tutorial and I can honestly say I can't remember a sausage out of that <laughs> I remember the heck of a lot more when I was mixing colours for an actual face so there you go <laughs> so just making a light colour you could see a bit of grass uh, in the distance it's just sort of lit up so there we go just putting it in. So I've um, decided, personally, I want to paint in a way that I want to paint. <laughs> um, I'm not going to paint in any way, shape or form, uh, any way um, that I don't think is the right way for me. It's kind of like a thing that I've got to at the moment. I feel like I can uh, just paint the way I want to paint and it doesn't matter. So if I want to mess around with a knife or if I want to use a brush, then I'll just do it and have fun with it. <laughs> That's the way I'm uh, feeling now. I don't feel restricted to techniques, I suppose. 
So I'm thinking about tree, tree. <laughs> I hope my little comments are helping. I've had a bit of uh, <laughs> a few bad reviews really about the these videos, but you know, it, I think they're better. I think than uh, me talking while painting because, to be honest, I'm so focused on my painting when you when you are painting and talking I think you can forget things and you forget to sit back and have a look and really try and make the painting good because that's the whole idea of doing it <laughs> to put as much of your skill and knowledge and ability and passion into your painting that's what you want to be doing you don't want to feel worried about time limitations or whether you've said the right thing while you're painting or if you're going off on talking about other things and I'd rather just paint I'm not saying I couldn't do it I just think this is better for me personally to create I can create these and I don't have to worry can just paint away and relax and enjoy it <laughs> so this brush if you're wondering what brush that is it's a Winsor Newton artist brush uh, a round brush I got it in a set a long time ago <laughs> got it off eBay it was really cheap actually but it's a really nice brush I forgot about it when I was digging through my stuff, my art stuff, I found them and I was like, ooh, brushes. So I'm trying to be flowy with this brush. And the way I'm holding it, look at the way I'm holding it. I've mentioned that in another episode. Some people uh, hold their brush like a pencil. And I would say... I won't say that's the wrong way. I would say this way is much better. <laughs> uh, for me, it is anyway. This way, you can allow your brush to flow more and you can feel the paint more. And uh, I, I like that. I was just going to show you another colour mix and then I thought, hmm, I could put some more in, let's get more in. And I'm using a colour that's only slightly darker than that background. So it works well. This is to create our depth and distance we use light colours. Light colours work for the background and then you can get progressively darker to the foreground. It's a... Uh, a nice easy simple trick that you can do so now we've got a bit of burnt sienna in this mixture because on the ground there's a load of leaves and there's dirt and I wanted to create a uh, an indication of that just thrown in colour I think uh, colour mixing is a a very important thing to get used to because if you can mix your colours right and get a, a harmony almost within your palette and and the feeling you're trying to get within that colour mix then uh, I think your paintings are just going to get better they're just going to improve a lot faster um, if your greens are too green and your blues are too blue and uh, your, all your colours are overly saturated <laughs> it's not going to be right it's going to be um, it's not going to have a natural feel to it because reality is it's not like that <laughs> very rarely anyway that's why I like going out painting 
I enjoy going out there with my paints, whether it's oils or gouache, and uh, experiencing that and looking at colours. Like I said about painting squares, you could get more out of taking a sketchbook and going in the woods than you will ever get from painting squares. <laughs> So I'm just indicating a few distant trees, tree trunks. You might see some, you might not. <laughs> I'm not worrying about it, I'm just putting a few in. I quite like the way it looks actually. It got a little bit too dark in the center of it. I would like to have lightened it up that a bit more, but <laughs> Really, it doesn't matter too much. Maybe it was a bit more denser there, or that was a bit further forward. And then I decided to soften it <laughs> and make these tree trunks almost disappear because I thought it was a bit too strong in the middle. I've left a couple. You can make these decisions and choices change your change your mind all the time you can do that so I'm getting some burnt umber and some burnt sienna in with my mixture bit of the white I'm just mixing it I'm still using the same brush loading the brush quite a, there's quite a lot of paint on there and uh, the paint isn't it isn't super dry it's it's just right for me to be honest for this way of painting the paints that I've made are pretty perfect <laughs> even if I do say so myself they're perfect yeah I'm, I'm, what I use to make my paint um, I obviously use a pigment uh, that I get dry and then uh, I mix it with cold pressed linseed oil and I get a really nice paint and that's all I use those two ingredients so I'm making a bigger tree I'm trying to create a bit of texture in the bark even though this tree isn't in the front I do want to create a bit of texture so getting a bit of white in the mixture and a bit of yellow in there in some of the greens and that you see in the tree so it was actually a um, quite an overcast day really there wasn't any strong sunlight or there wasn't any strong shadows or I don't really remember any shadows to be honest I'm just letting my brush go down the trunk. When you're creating your brush strokes, try and go with whatever you're doing. Go with the trunk. So if the, the trunk's going down and you want to project that feeling with your brush stroke, you pull your brush stroke down. And if, if you want it to be a really a w wide or round trunk then you would go around the trunk and maybe that's the kind of feel you want experiment with brush strokes they're, uh, they're fantastic to experiment with because you get ideas within ideas <laughs> but I tend to get ideas within ideas because of the brush strokes or, I c or maybe the best way to explain it is creating no <laughs> Uh, trying to think, trying to think, I'm trying to think of the word and um, the right word to use. I might have to come back to that thought. It's kind of a yeah. It's not the right word, but using the angle of the brush strokes to exaggerate form. Exaggerate isn't quite the right word, but it's the closest I can think of. 
<laughs> it's a feeling that you get when you're painting. I suppose you want to project a certain form with the brush strokes. Hopefully you know what I mean. <laughs> So you noticed I've put gone a little bit darker on that layer of land, so it's starting to come closer to us. It, the land is starting to come at us, which is the idea. It's very effective. If you're out, <laughs> if you if you if you're out and about painting, or if <laughs> or if you're designing uh, a painting and you're wondering how am I going to make distance in my painting how am I going to make it look like there's depth in there well the easiest simplest way is to make the colors lighter in the background and then make them darker as they get closer to you and then in addition to that as you could use the atmosphere color in the background and then as it gets closer to you there's less atmosphere color and then it becomes a bit more cleaner and clearer and crisper that's another way just uh, enjoying a nice cup of tea while I watch this Nice bit of a uh, white in that in that green. I really do like chromium oxide. <laughs> Ever since I've made it, I've really got used to it now, and I'm really enjoying using it. It's a quite a natural looking color, and with especially for trees, it gives a nice green for trees. paint that I've been making myself they are going to be coming available soon um, I've mentioned it a few times I'm almost there <laughs> you might not like um, the price point but no worries if you're not interested uh, I just thought I'd make them just in case you wanted to use them I'm going to try and make it competitive but at the same time, I'm grinding it myself, so <laughs> uh, you can't really uh, compete with the big boys. But anyway, so I'm uh, marking this tree out. It's a funny thing, is uh, tree colours actually, because uh, for a long time I thought, you know, trees are brown, and then. Uh, I went. I was used, obviously I walked my dog a lot, and uh, I was looking at the trees, and I was like, I haven't seen any brown trees yet, and I've been I've walked through a whole forest. <laughs> all, all the trees were green, greys and greens, greys and greens. And there's little bits of black in that tree. If you're uh, wanting to make a nice black, then uh, you don't even need black on your palette. You can use, although I do use ivory black quite a lot, because I know some of the color mixes that I remember, <laughs> I use that. Um, but you don't need to use it. You can use a nice mixture of burnt umber and ultramarine blue, and you get a really nice black. A black you can control as well because you can put more blue in or more brown in. More brown in makes it warmer, more blue in makes it colder. So you can control your blacks. <laughs> Funny actually, uh, impressionists. I know I, I'm a fan of impressionists, I'm not sure if you are. Um, but impressionists, they banned black and brown. <laughs> It's an interesting fact, isn't it? No black and no brown in their paintings. In their pigments, I should say. That's why they have so many nice reds and yellows and pinks and... 
just just fantastic i was in uh the national gallery recently and uh it's because my uh dad had an operation he had he had a heart problem and he had a heart operation and uh i went down to be like the carer but i had because it was in london um and all the best galleries are there well they are in Link england anyway and uh I got a chance to uh, pop in the National Gallery while I was there and I uh, was c closely studying my art heroes <laughs> there, there, there I was and the monks Rubens Rembrandt and talking about impressionists there, there I was um, stood in the middle of a couple of Monets on my right some Cezannes on my left, Pizarro's, Degas, Manet, uh, they're all there, Renoir. And there was this Renoir landscape there, and it was so vibrant and colourful. And I decided to put my head right up to the canvas <laughs> to see if I could spot any blacks or browns. And there wasn't any. So that gave me an idea. So at the base of trees, base of trees, you get a lot of these branches growing up. You have to have a look at that. When you look at trees, you don't just get trees just stuck in the ground and that's it. They get all kinds of branches growing from the bottom part or well, you get young trees growing as well. Yeah, I'm gonna do an episode in the future. A uh, impressionist's challenge. And I'm gonna only have the colors of an impressionist on my palette. And I have to do a painting using them. I think that'll be fun. Let me know in the comments if you like that idea. The impressionist challenge. And we'll choose a palette like maybe Monet's palette of colours or Cezanne's palette of colours. We'll we'll find one of their palettes of colours and then we'll just use that and we'll do a painting. That'll be fun. So I'm just putting in there's one tree behind the other there, so I thought, I know, I'll just block it in. Just block it in, block that tree in behind it. You don't have to have all your trees next to each other in a line, almost like soldiers. <laughs> you can have them right next to each other. And you can have them, you can have a group of them all next to each other with not a single gap, because you get it like that sometimes. You do get it like that, and uh, or you can have your trees in a line like soldiers, because you do get it like that as well. You can be creative. The w whatever you want, you can do it. So I'm just wiggling out some branches here with a liner brush, twisting it, turning it. It's just paint on the brush, just straight burnt umber, and I just grabbed it and loaded full of paint and just twisted it on there's no medium in there the only medium I use in this whole painting is a bit more linseed oil for the second layer which you'll see later so I'm just building up the bark there putting in some more branches hangy down branches all over the place <laughs> I was in this uh, forest once and uh, I was sat there we got my paints out and I sat there and I looked and I was like wow there's a lot of branches <laughs> <laughs> I never realised how many branches there were until you decide to paint them and there was millions so I was like well I can't paint all those I'll just have to pick out my favourite ones <laughs> And that's what I did. 
So I've gone quite dark now. We've got these trees over here. That's a uh, burnt umber and a bit of ivory black in there. There's a branch there as well. It's a broken off branch, that one. I'm pretty tired. I've been working early this morning. I thought I might as well uh, t do the audio for this video. Cause I know there's a few people that want to see it, get some ideas. That's what these videos are about. They're not about me showing off and saying, oh, look at me, look how amazing these paintings are. <laughs> <laughs> They're, well, maybe they are a little bit. <laughs> no, they're not. Um, what they're about is giving you ideas and getting you motivated to do paintings and and little tricks that you learn. And if it helps a couple of people, maybe if it helps one person get a little bit better, learn a little bit more, then my job's done as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So I like I like to help beginners to get better because I remember being a beginner and really I still am a beginner to be honest and um, it's good to help beginners get better at painting and this sort of thing it's more and more becoming a lost art uh, the, especially with the introduction of digital painting a lot of uh, artists that would have come to oils or acrylics or um, watercolours or gouache have chosen to move away from that and become digital painters I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but I'm, I do fear the art of creating a painting from paints and canvases may get lost so this is my way of trying to keep it there <laughs> <laughs> these videos <laughs> try and keep it popular I'm going to be bringing back a few other things which I think you'll enjoy I have big plans big plans <laughs> first I will conquer this then the world no <laughs> I'll just stick to painting videos so I'm going for it wiggling that brush twisting it, turning it getting with the flow of the painting think like a tree <laughs> do trees actually think? Hmm. some trees look like they do when I walk past them so I'm sure some of them are cursing me when I walk past there he is. There's that painter again. He's always staring at us. <laughs> <laughs> so I quite like using a round brush because I can twist it and turn it as I'm painting. And I feel a round brush you can use a little bit better when you do your trees rather than a flat brush. Well, I could anyway. So you've noticed it's starting to get a bit more depth in here, even though that tree, that uh, that um, warm coloured tree is quite a thick tree, and it is a big tree, in real life it is a big tree, and I wanted to keep it like that though, I wanted it to be there. Getting some burnt sienna, yellow ochre, a little bit of permanent crimson, a bit of blue, ultramarine blue. Mix in a brownish, reddish, yellowish. <laughs> like I said, play with your colour mixes. Have fun with it. Enjoy yourself using colour and experiment. So because this uh, land is 
going down and then across that's the way my brush strokes are going to go if you wanted it to be steep going upwards then your brush strokes would go that way but there's a nice base color on there a nice base so the brush strokes can lay on top of it it would be um, awkward to do if you had a white canvas and you was painting directly on white it would be a bit awkward I feel I'm not saying that impressionists didn't use white canvases because I'm sure they did and they were much better painters than me so they were able to do that <laughs> me I like to have a tone I like to have like an undertone a bit, a bit like the way Van Gogh would paint he would scrub in a uh, undertone and then paint on top of that the nice dark nice dark trees <laughs> actually this is on the edge of the woods um, behind us if you imagine you're stood here where I am painting if this was outside <laughs> behind us is an old church and it's uh, something I'm going to try and paint I'm, I'm, I did set up to paint it once I got all the way there I set up my easel which uh, Clive gave me uh, Clive Powell from Clive Five Art <laughs> he uh, made me an easel uh, a sketch easel that I put on a tripod and uh, so I loaded my bag up walked over there set everything up there I was ready to do a paint of the painting of this church and then I uh, realized I didn't have any paints with me <laughs> and I was like oh no I've walked all the way here and I haven't even got any paints so yeah so I ended up packing it all the way and coming back home <laughs> So uh, as a warning for you all, make sure you have your paints with you if you decide to paint outside. <laughs> so it's quite dark near the trees, so I put a little bit of a darker colour. Thinking about the recess and whether I want a path there. Make it still still trying to work that out really. grabbing some more of that brown on the liner brush let's bring in some more of these branches look how quickly you can put in a lot of branches though loads of them of course uh, don't tell anyone you do it like this if anyone asks you spent hours copying these when you was out in the forest the wind was blowing hard it was really uncomfortable and uh, but you really needed to do this and you wanted to paint every branch uh, one by one really slowly and you did that you didn't just throw in loads of branches in one go <laughs> and that way you can put a few more zeros on your painting instead of oh, uh, uh, I just wanted 50 quid for it, but no, it's got to be worth more than 50 quid now because you've done all these branches, so it's taken a lot of time. So now, you know, it's 100 quid, 200 quid. Or you go into the, uh, a museum and you find out a painting is worth 10 million. Well, maybe yours is worth 1 million then. <laughs> 
It's a funny thing is value, isn't it? Value of a painting. How do you value your own painting? You could just pick a number out of the air and just put that value on it. Some people say to me, "Oh, oh you should be, uh, you should be rich. You can paint. You, you should be making loads of money, selling paintings." I was like, "Well, uh, how much do you think I'm getting? Me is selling paintings, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands." <laughs> Who are these people that pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of paintings? I know they're out there. <laughs> but yeah, people always think that you make you must be making loads of money from selling your own paintings and um but then in the same breath they'll ask you to paint their dog and they'll offer you thirty, forty quid. And you think to yourself, well, there they are saying, oh, you must be making lots of money doing paintings and you're offering me 30 quid to do your portrait of your dog. <laughs> it's not even worth the time, really. I mean, I have done them. I've done plenty of dog portraits. Um, but I always try and keep creeping that price up because you don't want to be doing portraits for 30 quid. It's just not worth it. Even if you tell yourself, oh, oops. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. I was just mixing some green and then uh, maybe I went for a drink and then came back. Here we go. Mixing some green. Nice green, that is such a nice green. I tell you, that green is perfect. Chromium oxide with a little bit of cad yellow. Oh, God, it's so perfect. You get that tree colour, so perfect. A little bit of brown in it as well. So I'm uh, doing a lot of sitting back and looking at the painting as a whole and uh, trying to think about how I can make it, uh, well how I can give it more depth, how I can uh, constantly push things. <laughs> I had some apple pie and custard for, uh, for tea, well af after I had my tea. It was very nice. It's a good good painter's food, I think. Apple pie and custard. <laughs> so I've got some of this green, and then uh, the tree. I think it. I think they're yew trees, so they have like a, a few um, type leaves, really f small leaves. Um, but this is just an indication of it. I'm not going to paint in every little uh, mark of a leaf uh, I just want to create the mass of it and I want to create the flow of it and that's my excuse <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sticking to it because what's the point in painting every leaf unless it's a uh, focal point even the old masters didn't paint every leaf I, I was no nose to canvas on a constable and uh, he didn't and he was an academy painter, so if he doesn't do it, then I'm not. <laughs> there were some cracking sketches that he's done. In fact, if you've never heard of a John Constable, an English artist, he's one of the uh, great English masters, uh, painted the Hay Wayne, which is the most 
popular painting probably ever in the world the most commercial painting ever and uh, he revolutionized the art world by getting outside and painting because <laughs> believe it or not landscape painting was an indoor thing <laughs> And that amazed me, really, to know that people would learn how to paint trees and mountains and things, and and they would never venture outside with their paints. But Constable, he he had a bit more to him, and he went out there, and the Impressionists, they did as well. So it's one thing going out with your sketchbook and doing sketches and a lot of the artists did that Turner did that um, but there's another thing getting out there with your paints and oil painting on site and this is something new and his sky studies and things were they were fantastic and that's how he created a, a really good sky in a painting As, uh, you get people that are experts on clouds <laughs> and you do you get these people and they look at paint people's paintings and they can tell if this person is painted outside or not or if they've just done it inside or out their own head because of the cloud formations are not realistic but they can look at a constable and go oh god those clouds are spot on because he studied them he got out there and did them And uh, I'm a big fan of Constable and Turner. I'm a fan of a lot of painters, but being a, a an English artist myself, I'm a fan of the uh, other great English painters. <laughs> I say that because I'm putting myself in the same bracket as Turner and Constable now. <laughs> Yes, Munnings, Sir Alfred Munnings, a great horse painter, George Stubbs, another great horse painter, animal painter, John Constable, landscape painter, Turner, master of colour and light, fantastic landscapes and seascapes, Thomas Gainsborough, another fantastic portrait painter, and then uh, Jason Bowen. <laughs> Or whatever he is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good to dream though, isn't it? Good to dream. So I'm getting some uh, yellow in with the green. And you never know. You never know. My name might get mentioned amongst those as great English painters. You never know. So I'm getting some uh, white in there. Bit of white, bit of yellow, bit of green. If you want to keep a vibrancy to your colours, you want to try and use less white. <laughs> if you want to get a vibrant colour, uh, white takes away the uh, vibrancy, I find. I'm sure someone technical will know the reason. And in fact, that's why painters of yesteryear used to glaze a lot they would do a lot of glazes and they'd build up glazes to create colors that they want without the need of white and then their colors are more luminous and strong i could uh ravel on for hours about art history <laughs> I, I, re I absolutely love it i read i read a lot of really old books on painting so and their techniques and I find it really interesting so I'm just looking at spots of light I don't want to use this everywhere and it actually gets duller the more I use it but there are spots of light in there So 
So amazingly in this area, I never see anything. I never see any squirrels. I know there must be some squirrels around. Because in the... Uh, there's a forest just round the corner from here. When you, If you walk through, go a bit further. And there's loads of squirrels and things in there. In fact, in this forest, there's uh, a load of snowdrops. And I think snowdrops are coming out soon. So I need to get in there when the snowdrops are out. Because <laughs> it, it is incredible. There's so many in there, it looks like snow. <laughs> It's it's amazing. So I'm uh, getting my brush strokes going again, putting a bit more darker colour in there. And a bit more light. For areas where there's a bit of light, a bit of freshness. A lot of my um, colour mixing and things and brush strokes become instinctive. It becomes um, almost automatic instead of. <laughs> well, that custard is starting to uh, repeat on me a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, the decision making becomes kind of an instinct. I get the feeling that I need to do something and I just do it. I don't sit back and consider what I'm doing. It becomes a instinct to it and I get that feeling in my head. <laughs> like a warm feeling in my head and I'm going for it. I'm just going for it. I'm really enjoying it as well. I really enjoy painting like this. I'm really starting to enjoy just painting like this, using a mix of techniques. I think uh, personally, if all I did was the wet on wet approach in the way um, I originally learned, I think eventually I would get bored because I would want to do more and as a fan of other styles I like to learn other styles of painting as well and then try them out and uh, and bring it into my own painting and I would suggest you do the same really start studying the masters studying painters great painters I mean even um, if you're in America you've got like one of the greatest painters uh, sergeant who Fantastic painter, great one to study. One of Monet's friends. <laughs> I've seen a painting with uh, Monet in it that Sargent painted. <laughs> it's funny how they all knew each other, isn't it? I suppose they would. I started to consider doing a painting in the style of Turner because I was close up to his painting for a while and I started to get a feel of it. I think I could do one. I think I could express something anyway. So I'm looking at this area, putting a little bit of green in there, some like ivy or something growing on the ground you get that a lot in the woods you get some like plants dandelions and stuff and all sorts growing in there and it adds a little bit of variety because if you just have that one colour just all over it does get a bit boring it's good to have a variety and use the colors all over the painting when you're looking for um, that color harmony 
you want to achieve color harmony in your painting this, the easiest way is to use a limited palette of colors don't use millions <laughs> um, I almost want to throw up when I see some people's palettes and it's got tons of different colors on it <laughs> and I'm not I'm not even talking about beginners there I'm talking about professional painters and they have all these colors around them and I think what you don't even need all them you're not gonna get the uh, what I believe is a old-fashioned color balance in there with that amount of color that's what I think anyway but you know who am I so this little jar little jam jar doesn't have any jam in it <laughs> it's got linseed oil in and I put a stripe of linseed oil along there dip it into my brush because we're on another day uh, the painting has dried I've been to London and back <laughs> And I'm ready to finish it because uh, it needed to dry because I wanted to put some darks on there. So I'm using my blue and brown look, mixing it. My brush has already got some linseed oil in. And uh, the reason I've got linseed oil on there is because a, a thin paint, a... Uh, <laughs> let's explain this. So when you do an oil painting, when it dries, the next layer on top needs to have more oil in it than what's underneath it. So if you're if you're doing a painting and your first layer is oily, then you need to make that next layer even oilier, uh, which makes it quite difficult, which is why um, a lot of painters will stick in a paint thinner or a turpentine or something for their first layer because then when that evaporates it only leaves the paint and there's probably not much of it and it, but it's been able to spread across by using a, um, a spirit or mineral so in my method the way I'm doing it I've used paint straight out of the tube first and then the next layer has a little bit of oil in it it's as simple as that and if you wanted to do a layer on top of that then you'd have a little bit more oil in it it's, it's that simple really and there's different techniques you can do to prevent um, the painting looking kind of dry as it saps some of the oil from the paint from above um, you just oil out and you basically just put in more linseed oil on top and then it shines it all out again but we won't get too technical on that it's something for you to uh, look up <laughs> so I'm putting in my dark but I'm uh, leaving some of this light on there as well and leave, making sure I leave some of that warm that under underneath there's like a nice warmth to that tree and I'm leaving that because I like that bit more of the oil see always get a bit of the oil bit of the green bit of the brown bit of the blue so I'm just feeling the paint and just letting it pull just feeling it and letting it pull while drinking a cup of coffee how much of a master am I? <laughs> yeah. Cappuccino in one hand, paintbrush in the other. This is living the life. This is the life. So I'm leaving these little holes of light, lighter and darker as well, in on the tree trunk to create the... Uh, sort of a texture on the trunk so 
Uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying my painting at the moment. I'm probably enjoying it the most I've ever enjoyed it. And I think it shows in my work. I think I needed some time to study more and I uh, gave myself that time so I feel like I'm uh, a lot better as a painter. And uh, I've done a few quite difficult commission work so I feel a bit more confident because when you do really difficult paintings and really push yourself it makes painting a whole lot easier. It's a bit like weightlifting. You, you start off with a light weight and then you start getting he lifting heavier and heavier and heavier. And then if you go back and lift the light weight, it, it's really easy. <laughs> I think painting's a bit like that. If you can paint 50 people in a painting, you can paint trees, no problem. If you can do a portrait, you can paint a tree really easily and you'll it'll almost flow off your brush and it feels good I'm not saying uh, tree painting landscapes is um, easier than painting portraits though um, I think it's the same it's all the same it's just some are more mentally taxing than others I'm sure once you get used to painting people and 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 uh, faces. I'm sure it becomes like easy. My nana always said, says to me, that landscape painting is harder than uh, portrait painting because a portrait painter they only have to learn how to paint faces, where a landscape painter have got to learn how to paint everything. <laughs> and I never really thought of it like that. So I was just uh, realised that my drink was finished. <laughs> Having a bit more, a bit more of the cappuccino. A bit more brown and green. So I should mention, I've I've got to mention, I have got a reference picture on my easel that I start with, but I don't really use it because I use it just for an idea to start with. And then I start to just develop the painting the way I want it, because I don't want to copy the picture. Um, that that's something I'll leave to if I get commissions to do. Then I'll, you know, that's all you end up doing: copying pictures. It's a bit boring to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're uh, being creative like this and feeling the painting and doing what you like I find that the most fun saying that <laughs> I've got this challenge to do uh, of a, a double dog portrait for somebody um, a commission and I really want to do it so that one's different I've got to a point where I want to pick work if someone wants their dog painting and I like the idea of it I'll do it but I don't want to just do it for the sake of it because if you don't enjoy it you don't get you don't have any motivation to do it so you'll see me flowing around the painting in this point I'm just flow the brush is just flowing I'm gliding around just putting in those little bits of darks creating quick brush strokes quick shapes no worries, all happiness. I've got that painter's smile going. I'm enjoying it. I'm happy. The laughing, joking. <laughs> I'm on a real painter's high at this point. And I do get on these painter's highs. I get really high on my painting. I know um, 
<laughs> someone messaged me asking me what I take <laughs> and it says I don't take anything I just enjoy painting and I'm passionate about it and I really enjoy it and that's all I need and a cup of coffee is nice well, I, don't, I don't need anything else so I'm getting a bit of uh, cad red some burnt sienna and uh, another sip of the old cappuccino <laughs> And then starting to darken up this area under the trees. So this dark, it really has made the painting better, having that darkness there. It's made those trees go back in space, made these trees come forward in space. It's just a massive improvement, massive. So remember what I said, I'm using directional strokes. You could do something like this. You you could paint something like this, no problem. I I, I believe in it. you could, and I, I know you could. A bit of practice, you could do something like this, no problem. What you want to uh, try to do is really think about your brush strokes. I know I'm saying... I'm not thinking, I'm just going for it. Um, it's because I've done a lot of thinking about it before, so I'm just doing it. I'm instantly kind of trained myself in a way to just do it. And uh, But to start with, you really think about it. Think about what direction your brush stroke goes and why, and and start playing with that. <laughs> and it will, it will start to uh, become just a language. It becomes your language. It's a bit of red in there now. It's a bit of red, just dotted in. Warm it up a little bit. In with that. In with the green. In with the sienna. We're creating almost a pathway. It makes you kind of the brush strokes make you drawn to that area of the painting. Drawn in. Makes you want to go in there and walk around. <laughs> it's funny because. Uh, I actually do. <laughs> I want to paint a painted version of myself in there. I might do that on one of my episodes. Paint myself painting. Hmm. That's a good idea. So I'm wiggling out a few more branches. There's always room for a few more branches. <laughs> couldn't get the paint to stick there <laughs> so I put a little bit more oil in and then I was like still not sticking so I stabbed it with the brush and that made it stick <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just building that area up because those uh, branches that die off they usually get loads of little branches growing up off them so I put some Yeah, I hope this uh, is giving you an idea though on painting uh, something like this. If you want to have a go, maybe you want to have a go at this one, have a go. It's a good fun one to do, I enjoyed it. You'll find yours will look different, it'll have your own unique stamp on it. Every painter has their own unique way of using their brush, because like handwriting, and that's why um, the paintings get analysed by e handwriting experts and paint experts. <laughs> because we have a unique way of loading our brush and putting paint on the canvas. It's like handwriting. Even uh, the copyists, the best copyists, <laughs> um, when they analyse the handwriting of the signatures, they can spot a fake. It's these experts that do them without signatures, you know. They're the, uh, 
<laughs> the clever ones because I don't think they can uh, these exceptional forgers I mean they could probably do it anyway I know I've got I've been told that um, 50 percent of art is forged <laughs> I do like uh, that whole. In yeah, I find it all interesting that there's painters out there that didn't get the recognition that they deserved, so they painted a load of masterpieces and sold them as originals. <laughs> but they got approved as well. So I just put in my JB on there. This is uh, the end of this episode. I hope it wasn't too long for you. Um, and if you did make it all the way through, congratulations. You listened to me waffling on for a while. And uh, <laughs> so there you go. The Edge of the Woods. Thanks very much for watching this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you at another one. Cheers. Bye.